Okay, hello once again and welcome to the VegFest UK Summerfest Online 2020. The first time we've been doing a show of this nature and it's been an incredible experience so far. Uh, we've had some most awesome panels, the live stream function has been working really well um, and we've got some great presentations uh, up there too in the auditorium. So if you're just joining the show, thank you for coming along. If you're new to this whole experience, I hope you're finding it a good one. Um, do invite your friends and colleagues um, and do remember that the, uh, the talks will be available for another 30 days here so you can come and access these talks. This panel is being recorded. So this will also be available as from Sunday uh, to be able to be viewed, uh, of course, free. It's accessible free, it's accessible all over the world. Um, so it's fantastic information. Whilst you're here too, if you're listening after the panel, they'll be available to chat. There's a chat room function to come and talk to our expert panelists here. Um, and of course, the all important exhibitors too. We have a wonderful array of exhibitors who I know would just love to see you. Do come along, have a little browse, possibly even a little bit of a shop. Ha say hello, have a bit of a chat and an engagement with our exhibitors. A little thank you to our sponsors who are behind us. We have Yayo Hemp Products and Butte Island Foods, both of whose support has been invaluable for this. Um, and if you are enjoying the value of all of these talks, please do feel free to go and make a donation towards the cost of these events. It's free now. We don't have any ticket revenue, but if you feel it's worthwhile, I'd like to support our work we have the Friends of VegFest UK initiative up and running. It's basically our little donor box. You'd be very welcome to support us. And of course, share too and invite people to come and join in the fun. So on that note, um, with the VegFest UK Summerfest fitness panel, fitness recovery, plant-based recovery, strength and endurance, and it's going to be hosted by my very good friend, and um, very uh, dedicated, uh, passionate, vegan athlete and all round decent person, activist and uh, indeed a Liverpool supporter. So celebrating the long waited 30 year wait for that premiership title. So he is on a good form. Dave Sheehan, thank you very much. And of course, all our panellists who are joining us, thank you. Dave, you have the honours of um, introducing our panel. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks for the introduction. And yeah, we're still trying to celebrate after 30 years of pain. So yeah, being a Liverpool fan is pretty cool at the moment. Just want to thank VegFest and Tim, of course, for having me and for giving me the opportunity to host this panel and to host such an awesome lineup of, of panelists. I just want to start off by getting everyone just to say hi. So from Colorado, Robert Cheek. Hey, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. It is so great to be back with VegFest UK for the first time in, I, I think, four years uh, since that trip to London. So great to see you, and I appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks for your time. You said it's, what, 9.30 a.m. over there in Colorado. So, you know, thanks for coming in so early. And, uh, yeah, it was great meeting you that time in London four years ago, and it's been great to stay connected since. Next run into UK, because uh, we have three countries represented here in this panel. So on to Annie Connolly. How are you, Annie? Hello, I'm good, thank you. And thank you for all everything you've done to get us actually going with this today and the whole of VegFest. It's weird and strange being doing it like this and not seeing everybody like we usually do at the events, but it's so good that something's still carrying on and that it is still happening. So good work, well done. Yeah, thank you. And this is where like VegFest and Tim need a big, you know, round of applause, pat on the back, because yeah. you know, with all that's happened this year, they've adapted, they've reinvented, they've reacted positively to what's gone on and um so you know the upheaval they've had in their business so fair play to them and what they've done and last but not least in the uk as well nathan lapton how are you very good thank you yeah great to see you again dave it's been a while and um, yeah same again to tim as well it's done a fantastic job of getting all this online hopefully lots of people see it lots of people watch this after the event as well if they've not seen it live and hopefully get some good inspiration from us all Exactly. I'm, I'm sure they will. You know, we've got three incredible people. We're all very, very passionate about what we do. 
Um, we're very passionate about helping people. We're very genuine about giving of our time. That's why we're here right now. Um, just as a quick start off, just I want everyone for just a couple of minutes, just give a little bit about their background from the vegan perspective in terms of how many years they're vegan, you know, and maybe what stimulated them to go vegan in the first place. So just maybe about two minutes or so each if you need that. So we start with uh, ladies first, Annie. Um, oh gosh, two minutes. Right, here we go. Uh, I've been vegetarian for a very long time. Um, and I was, I was vegetarian uh, whilst I was competing as well. So I'm a um, middle distance athlete, or I was um, a middle distance athlete. So 1500, 3000 cross country. Um, at the time I was vegetarian, but then um, after my career ended, um, I took up another sport, which was um, right. I took up for a little bit um, horse riding, uh, or I helped out with, with, um, with, ex race horses and rehabilitating ex race horses and it was the connection with those animals and it was the connection with the horses that just just triggered something which is what did make me or certainly had a huge effect on me going vegan um and so i've been vegan now for around about five years i'd say um and and obviously it was the best thing that i've ever done um and whilst vegan i've actually i've done uh, probably more than what I've done previously in terms of competitions and things. I've done um, a couple of triathlons and then I uh, kayaked the channel and then got straight on my bike and, and cycled from Brighton to London. So um, all vegan. Um, and so it just proves that you can do anything. Uh, so, yeah. Very good. And yeah, you proved that in your Instagram story. You sure give it away. <laughs> See this girl on the bike, she gives a serious welly. <laughs> Uh, yes, I do. In that term, I definitely, definitely practice what I preach. <laughs> yeah. Great stuff, Annie. Right, we'll go on to Robert next. So, Robert, again, a little bit about you know your background, how long vegan, and again, what stimulated you to go that way. Yeah, thanks again, Dave. Appreciate you having me. And you know, I became vegan back in 1995, uh, just about 25 years ago. I grew up on a farm and raised farm animals. We had cows and and sheep and uh, goats and chickens and rabbits and all these different animals, horses. Uh, and, you know, once I got to know animals and realized they all had their own personalities, their own desires to live a life uh, free of fear, pain and suffering that I decided I, I did not want to contribute to animal suffering anymore. But I was a pretty small kid, you know, I was really small as a, a long distance athlete, but even small for that particular sport. And I wanted to get bigger and stronger. And so I set out to do that. A few years later, I started lifting weights and eventually got into the sport of bodybuilding and ended up winning bodybuilding competitions on a, a plant-based diet, vegan lifestyle, kind of in the little bit early days, 2005, and uh, filmed a documentary about it uh, called Vegan Fitness Built Naturally, and then wrote my book, Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, and had the wonderful opportunity to tour to places like London and Australia and Asia and around the, the world. And uh, now I'm, I just finished up my fifth book. And so now I write about all of these experience for experiences for a quarter of a century of building muscle on a plant-based diet. I don't know how many stones it is, but I've put on about 100 pounds, from a 120 pounds to 220 pounds over the, the course of my, my vegan experiences, uh, mostly as a weightlifter and bodybuilder. So I'm here now. I'm still a passionate animal rights activist. That is what always fueled me. Was, that was my reason for becoming vegan and what always compelled me to want to make a difference in the lives of animals and make a difference in the world around me. And so having this kind of platform and the opportunity to share information and answer questions is uh, something I'm very grateful for. So thank you again, and it's a pleasure being here. Fantastic, Robert. I know it's, it's, it's fantastic watching your journey all the time that I've known you and before we ever connected and you know, you've done so much for the cause and you're so passionate about it. And anyone who hadn't seen the pictures of Robert from when he was a kid, and his journey up along, you've got to check them out. Like the transformation is truly incredible. Like when he says he was a skinny kid, he was a skinny kid. And um, you know, he, does, he does amazing, amazing work. So thanks for that, Robert. Right, Nathan, on to you. Again, a little bit about how long you're vegan and um, you know, what stimulated, stimulated you to make that decision at the time. Yeah, so um, it's almost to the day, 15 years, I believe. It was mid-August when I, when I turned vegan 15 years ago. So. Not sure exactly the date, but it was uh, it was very close to probably today. So, so it's my 15 year uh, vegan anniversary today. Um, mm. So, celebrating with us. 
Yeah, so uh, my my reasons really for going vegan were my, my ex-girlfriend at the time, who I've got uh, two children with now, has been vegan the whole life. Um, she sent for some information through from a company called Animal Aid, which is still around now. Uh, it came through the post in a in a big uh, brown envelope, loads of different information. Uh, we both sat down on the sofa, read through it, and didn't really say a word to each other. She was vegetarian at the time, so she had a bit of an idea, but I was, you know, eating pretty much everything. And uh, yeah, uh, got everything sort of thrown at me at once, realized that the world we live in isn't a very nice place, especially to the animals that we, you know, use and abuse. So from that, from that moment, we both went vegan. We, we decided it and uh, went through the cupboards, gave everything away that wasn't vegan, and that was, uh, yeah, that was 15 years ago. Fantastic. And a great little story and happy anniversary as well. It's a <laughs> anniversary to celebrate. It's great to celebrate with us. <laughs> so on to myself, like I'm vegan. I went 100% vegan 1st of January 2012. So it's what, eight coming up towards nine years at this stage. You know, I'm always honest about this one. When I thought of veganism before that, especially five to 10 years before that, I saw it as something that was a bit like a cult, some fatty diet, something that just crazies went on basically, and a very hippie kind of thing. So that was, I was the typical archaic kind of view of what veganism was. What started to stimulate me was my son, when he was born in 2005, I was told he was going to be vegan. I thought, oh my God, what is going to happen to this poor child and expect him to be in hospital like within a week. But again, I observed him over the next few weeks, months, even years, never getting sick, not even a cold, not even a runny nose. Like it was pretty incredible watching that development and his cognition, his body growth, everything. And um, made me very curious and the stuff I'd been told about veganism. I thought, hey, I'll go back, have a little look at the information and uh, looked at it, try things out. And and over the course of that, what was it, seven years in 2005 to 2012, I uh, gradually moved more and more that direction. And um, it was actually a tub of Ben and Jerry's September 2011 tasting really sour. That was the final straw. My favorite Ben and Jerry's was no longer something I could eat. So, okay, I said, might as well just go the whole hog, 1st of January 2012, and off I went. So, um, yes, yeah, so that was my little journey towards me going vegan. I just want to touch back a little bit on what we kind of said, but just... What was, what was the real moment that kind of, you know, the real moment, the real purpose that stimulated you to make that full decision to go vegan? Like, I'll start with myself. Like, um, again, typically honest with it, it's, it was always initially selfish reasons and that I felt such a difference from my training and particularly a moment when I was out on a long cycle one time. Typically when I'd hit about an hour, hour 15, I would start to flag a little bit and lose energy and I'd have to dig deep. It became more about mindset. Whereas I found in one particular cycle that around an hour, hour 15, where typically I would flag, I actually got an extra kick. And that was something that stuck with me as in terms of, right, what's going on here? And the thing that was different was at the time, I was probably 85, 90% vegan. So that was my kind of main trigger. So if we go, uh, go to Robert. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So uh, you're right, I didn't address that specifically, even though I grew up on a farm, I had all these farm animals. Sure, I lived with them for, you know, 15 years before I decided to become vegan at age 15. And the catalyst for me was my older sister, Tanya, was organizing an animal rights week at our high school. This, start, this started on December 8th, 1995. And I thought, you know what? She was already vegan. I had no interest in it, to be honest. But I thought, just out of respect for my older sister, I'm gonna spend a week and not eat animals, you know, see how this goes, right? And, you know, day number one, day one, I watched videos of factory farming and very specifically animal testing. And that just really hit me, you know, seeing animals with their legs tied back and, you know, things put in their eyes and, and all of that. It was something I wasn't used to because I grew up on a small farm, uh, 20 acres. And yes, we had a dairy right next to us, dairy farm. And there was another dairy farm about a mile away. And I was in the 4-H program. Not sure if you have that where you are, but you show animals at the county fair and you eventually uh, often sell them at the auction, you know, to be most likely turned into food. And I did the same. I would sell a, a baby calf. I would sell rabbits. Uh, as a young kid, I made money. I thought that was exciting, right? We don't always connect a lot of those things. So I went about my life until that, that day, December 8th, 1995, my sister organizes Animal Rights Week and I participated. And what I tell people and what I've been telling people for 25 years is that what I did was 
I stopped and I listened. I had conversations. I talked about topics I hadn't discussed before. I talked about animal rights and what their voices are and how their voices are not heard and how they don't have the opportunity to, to speak up and how they have their own interest in, in you know, having their own families and live their own lives and we you know, breed them and keep them captive and then eventually uh, slaughter and eat them. And that just didn't sit well with me. And I, I was already an athlete. I was a five sport athlete. I was a pretty good distance runner. You know, I was the fastest runner in school. I was a basketball player, a soccer player. I was involved in track and field and cross country and wrestling. I was already an athlete and I wondered, can I really do this? I, mean, I really thought about that. Can I really do this on a vegan diet? I mean, come on, milk does the body good is what we learned growing up. And that meat is where you get your protein. And I was a small kid. I mean, Dave, you're not, you're not joking. You look at my photos before and after. I mean, when I was 14, I weighed 89 pounds. Again, don't know how many stone that is, but it's like one rock. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty small. And, and so I had to learn that, you know what? Plants have all the protein you need. That plants will supply all the vitamins, minerals, amino acids, essential nutrients, uh, uh, building blocks of protein, phytonutrients, antioxidants, all these things that we can build and construct our bodies and build endurance and strength and all of that. And so I did it. I pursued it, became a champion runner, uh, long before I became a champion bodybuilder. And what I found was that the same diet worked for both. I just had to consume more calories or focus on specific foods for building muscle versus endurance. But uh, that was what did it for me. It was, you know, I just didn't want to cause harm to animals. And once I got exposed to the real truth and the reality in, in the world around me, then I realized I got to do something different. And this was before the internet. Uh, I had, you know, not a, no, no documentaries and very few books, had to kind of learn my own way. And then, you know, I did that and then eventually wrote my own books and then the internet took off. And now we've got, you know, incredible resources, including like this and all the work that each of you do. And so that's what I continue to do now, 25 years later, is just to try to lead by some sort of example based on my experiences. Excellent, Robert. And um, yeah, it's like, I suppose, the whole thing, it's like in what you grew up in and what you saw. And as you said, it even was exciting going selling, getting the calves. You know, they, it's, I suppose this is where the emotional connection needs to be recreated for people, like created in their consciousness, which is the problem. People don't have that consciousness to realize what's on that plate was actually once living, you know, and that's the thing. It's just that moment. So, you know, it's great that that was your spark. And we need more people getting that. And um, in terms of the setting animals in Ireland, anyway, it's called a mart, M-A-R-T, where the farmers take them to the mart and then people buy them. So I'm not sure if it's the same in the UK. Um, Annie, on to you next. So again, that kind of moment, you know, that experience, it really was the kind of the catalyst to really make you go and choose a vegan lifestyle. I've always had um, a, a real connection with animals um, as far back as I can ever remember. Um, certainly seemingly more so with animals than, than humans at times. It was always sort of my go-to if I ever had anything going on in my life. I would always, the, you know, the, the family cat, the rabbits, I would always be found with them. So I've always had a deep affinity with animals, always. The actual vegan moment for me, I think, came, I am quite a deep thinker. And, and I remember um, I was... Um, I think I grew up in uh, Yorkshire, so I'm surrounded by, you know, so many farms. Um, I'm constantly surrounded by farm animals. And um, with me being so heavily involved with horses, um, you generally tend to spend a lot of time, even more so amongst, uh, around and amongst farmers. Um, and knowing them and knowing the methods that were used, seeing firsthand what happened on, you know, on, on dairy farms and riding through farms, I would see certain practices happening. I, I would see it myself. Um, suddenly I realized that certain things that I believed previously wasn't actually the case. Um, and it was a, con it was almost, it was like convenient propaganda really for us to believe what we're told in order to, um, think it's okay to to buy into the dairy and the meat industry i was once riding through um through a farm and um there was a pen of calves 
um, and they'd just been taken away from their, their mothers. And at one side of the farm, I could hear the, the, the dairy cow, the mothers literally screaming. And then on the left hand side, I had the calves looking at me as, as we're walking through. They were complete, they were perplexed, they were bewildered, they looked genuinely frightened. And, and I think, you know, we all have our own, way, our, our own moments and I, at my, and I connected with one particular, our eyes met. And it was in that moment I looked and, and it, was, it was almost, uh, and I know it sounds silly, it was almost asking me for help, it needed help. And I felt completely useless. Here I was, I was on the other side, perfectly capable. Yeah, I was, there was nothing I could do to help this, this, this poor animal that was almost, that was in the only way it could, trying to get me wanting help. Um, and I couldn't ignore that. I couldn't, I couldn't forget that. And so I went home and I was thinking, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And the, in that moment, the only thing I could do was to not buy into it. You know, it, it, the only way we can make a difference in that moment and directly is to not buy into it. So that cow, that calf has not been separated for its mother for me. Um, and I, it was as simple as that. And, and I went vegan immediately. And the health benefits of a vegan diet is, is a welcomed bonus. If there wasn't, I would have still gone vegan because I, I feel so strongly that, that, that as you know, fellow animals, they should not, they're not here on this earth for us. That they're, they're not, you know, um, being put on this earth and your only chance of life, you, you have no freedom. You have you, those, those feelings that we have, you know, that, that they also expect, that they also feel uh, they are denied that. I can't, that for me is just does not sit right. And, it, and I feel more comfortable with the fact that I know this happens, I know it goes on, but not for me. I will abstain regardless. Um, but like I said, the health benefits, which are undeniable, um, are just a welcome benefit. But for me, it's solely the animals. I, I believe that they deserve and they have every right to live a free, a free natural life. Um, and when we have everything available to us and we live such a sophisticated lifestyle, it's completely unnecessary. It's a great story as well, like we were saying there, in terms of making eye contact with the calves. And it reminded me of a story I put up this morning on my Instagram story or all my different stories. A post I saw was of a, a matador who raised a bull and then yes. to come then for the bull to have his fight. So he's over fighting anyway with the, the matador, but his, the, the matador who raised him was in the crowd at the front row, and the, mat, the bull was literally on, just about to die, hadn't much left, made its way over to the matador in the first row of the crowd, put his head up, the matador gave him a kiss and basically sent him on. So again, it's like I'm saying that emotional connection. He only saw he'd raise him for that fight to get killed. He just, like Annie had that connection with the calf and the pen and the eyes and she woke up, this mattered or didn't. So again, it's, it's, it's just a different ways that we're different, we're affected. And mm. it's just again a case of our emotional consciousness being wake, woken up and for some, it's just not for whatever reason. So lovely story, Annie. Um, Nathan, uh, like you touched on it there in your little intro in terms of, you know, your, that moment, that experience, we can just, you know, develop a little bit more in terms of, um, again, that moment, that experience that stimulated you. Yeah. So, yeah. So I did talk about it a little bit before, but I can, uh, um, expand on it a little bit. Um, so before before this happened, uh, I didn't didn't think at all about um, where food came from. I wasn't uh, I wasn't particularly uh, interested in animals. So a, a bit opposite to uh, Annie and Robert, but um, I didn't uh, have any association with animals. The only association really was uh, if I did, if I'd eaten a bottle that was that was from an animal. So um, it was a little bit, uh, it's a little bit strange, I suppose, in a way that I, I connected so much with it, but it was, uh, it was purely this instant impact of knowing everything that, uh, you know, really got me thinking of, thinking sort of outside the, the normal box, I suppose, where people just eat without thinking. Um, I had to change, you know, and uh, it was things, you know, like, like Robert said about um, um, seeing things on vivisection and, you know, the just the, every single way we could 
abuse animals, we, we were doing it. And uh, most of it, you know, almost all of it's behind closed doors. And uh, once you know about it, you either ignore it, which unfortunately quite a few people do, or you, or you have to change. And uh, the only option for me was to just completely, you know, completely give up all those animal products. Um, I did um, dabbled in a little bit of weight training before before I went vegan, um, just to, you know, as a young kid, 17, I was, you know, doing a few weights in the gym and then I went traveling around the world for a couple of years, um, early twenties. Uh, and then all this happened uh, a couple of years later. Um, and then, and that's when I got into training again, you know, properly this time, but this was all completely vegan. So this is where I uh, noticed that not only was I, you know, not doing anything to harm animals, I was actually, you know, Becoming strong, becoming you know very fit, never getting ill. Um, also, I had my my first child. He was born in two thousand and five, and then my second child in two thousand and seven. Um, and they've been vegan their whole life. They're thirteen and almost fifteen now. Um, my eldest, who's fourteen still at the moment, is already taller than me, bigger feet. Um, uh, my thirteen-year-old is uh, is getting very close to to being as tall as me already um, and they've never had any animal products in their whole life so that's another reason you know that we can uh, you know it doesn't matter what people say I've got proof of two you know fully grown mm. children that have been vegan their whole life so uh, if there's any any other proof you need I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure why you need it but um, yeah so that's my story yeah, yeah. fantastic amazing. and you know credit to you with your two kids you know to raise them vegan because again it went really against the grain I was like, I yeah. can go back with my own son. Like, no one supported it. Like, my, my wife at the time, like, she stuck to her guns, which fair play to her doing that. Because, again, I was very much against it. Both families were against it. And it's hard. And society in general, you know, was not something that was seen as, let's say, normal. Um, but the more the big thing is, it's like when you get that aha moment. That's why I wanted us each to share it. You get that aha moment, there's kind of, there's definitely no going back. And it only increases and increases intensity whether it be, you know, again, the health side, the animals, the planet, like it becomes like a tree-pronged effect, you know, um, and it's just getting that emotional consciousness. And what I want each of us to do now is, and we start with Robert, um, if you take, you know, pre, there's pre-vegan and there's post-vegan, and you know, we've all competed in different types of trainings, like two are mainly in bodybuilding, two of us are, in, are mainly in endurance during our vegan journey. You know, that, that kind of comparison between pre-vegan in terms of recovery and, um performance and post and the difference you felt because for a lot of people you know and you're touching it Robert like they feel oh I'll never be able to perform as well I'll never recover as well you know I can't take that risk nearly to go vegan because I'm probably going to just fall apart lose all my muscle get slower and so on so if you just you know explain a bit about your own personal experience like we all have had a pre and post and the impact you felt by when you went vegan. Yeah absolutely thanks Dave I appreciate the question and I appreciate all of you sharing your stories and you know, it's, it's such a, a powerful example when we hear each of you speak because, it, like you said, Dave, the, the moment that, that really clicked in our minds and in our hearts to become vegan is something that has compelled us to stick with it this whole time. You know, like you said, there's no going back. And there's, because we have this desire to truly, to truly help others and make a difference in the lives of others. And it's, and it's painful to think of contributing to animal cruelty these days you know just before i get to your question i just want to say you know people say robert don't you miss you know don't you miss steak or don't you miss beef or don't you miss meat or don't you miss hot dog or all these things i'm not at all i'm completely turned off by that when i go to the grocery store i can't even look at it you know i don't want to look at it i don't want to smell it i don't want to see it i'm not interested at all at all and of course now there's a, a vegan version of everything you know there maybe there wasn't uh, so many years ago but now there is so Dave, your question is very interesting. Uh, and it's a little bit difficult for me to answer, to be honest, because as you know, I became vegan at age 15. I'm 40 now, 40 years old now. So I was already an athlete at 15, mind you. Uh, I was an endurance athlete, but I wasn't paying much attention. You know, I was barely in, in the high school, second year into high school. I wasn't paying attention to my athletic performance or anything back then. And so, yes, after I went fully plant-based, yes, I got faster. Yes, I got bigger. Yes, I got stronger. Uh, yes, I became a better athlete, but I was also just getting older too. I was growing, getting older. So it was really hard for me to say. But what I will, will say is that 
I started out as a long distance runner. I even ran at the, at the university level. You know, I was a pretty fast runner. I was uh, something I, I joked that maybe I should have just stuck with that. You know, it was something that I was naturally good at. Bodybuilding and building muscle, I was not good at at all. And in fact, I think Dave, you might know this from, from one of my books, that when I first started lifting weights, I was already five years into a vegan lifestyle. I, I lifted weights for a whole year and made zero progress. Now that had nothing to do with a plant-based diet. That had to do with me and understanding that I needed to consume more calories than I was expending. I needed to reduce my cardiovascular training. I was still running, I was cycling, I was doing all of these things and expecting to put on a whole bunch of muscle. And I, I had to understand I needed to eat more calorie dense foods and maybe eat more frequently. And at the end of the day, I needed a combination of resistance weight training and a calorie surplus in my diet. Once I figured that out, you know, after, I mean, a year of zero progress, lifting weights, making, building muscle, the very next year, nothing changed. In fact, the next week after I failed, all of a sudden I started making progress and more progress and more progress and more progress. And in one year I went from runner to bodybuilder. Like in one year I put on 28 pounds in, in one year. Uh, I did the body for life program that Bill Phillips program that really got me started. I learned I needed to eat uh, six meals a day. I had to train six days a week with weights. Uh, I needed to put myself in a position to be successful. And Dave, let me tell you, when I did, not only did I go from making zero progress, I made really fast progress. I was a champion bodybuilder just a few years later. Again, on stage, beating other bodybuilders who eat chicken six times a day. And I put on significant muscle, significant weight, uh, significant athletic performance in improvement. And so in that regard, I basically, that wasn't necessarily plant-based versus non-plant-based, but what it was was a greater understanding of the athletic performance benefits of a specific um, calorie intake and, and nutritional requirement. And so as I figured that out, I was able to become a, a multi-time champion bodybuilder and write books about this stuff. And then Dave, you know, I I, you know, I kind of got tired of bodybuilding after 10 years. It took a toll on my back and my joints, my muscles. You know, I trained hard. I worked really hard. I was super motivated, super driven. I had already won multiple bodybuilding titles. Uh, I met Arnold Schwarzenegger and all these other famous bodybuilders and traveled around the U.S. And I was done. And I got back into running. And so I had no business running, right? I hadn't run, period, in a decade. I mean, not even down the street. I mean, I stopped running because I wanted to build muscle. But I got back into running and after 10 years of no running at all. And after a few months of training, uh, I ran uh, four half marathons. I ran a bunch of 5Ks. I ran a three hour timed race. I covered 22 and a half miles in those three hours on this you know, fairly tough terrain. And I, I was able to achieve as an endurance athlete again even at age 35, uh, and you know, I hadn't run in a decade. And then I, when I was done with that, I started lifting weights again. And even in my late 30s, became the biggest and strongest I'd ever been in my entire life, which is some of those photos you're referencing from just a year or two ago. And so for me, Dave, and, 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 and for, for Andy and Nathan and everyone else tuning in, it was just a different evolution. It was just a different process of my training and my lifestyle and really we were really meant to me right here. You know, I checked in with my heart and said, you know what? I'm good at running, but I want to get, I want to lift weights and get bigger and stronger. Like that means something to me. And if I can do that and do it successfully, maybe it will inspire other people. Maybe we can save some animals along the way. That was really, that was honestly my goal. And some personal uh, achievement was a, you know, a, a benefit or byproduct of that and be able to write some books and stuff. And so, you know, my performance did reach its all time high on a plant-based diet. And I still feel like maybe the best is yet to come, you know, age 40 now, um, just start lifting weights regularly again recently. And, you know, it's starting, you see that, I don't know if that fits on the screen. <laughs> you have to, uh, back up here. It's filling it's, the screen. Yeah. 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 And it's nothing compared to Nathan, by the way, Nathan's biceps are unbelievable. I, I have biceps like, on biceps. Yeah, I have to like run out of the room when Nathan flexes. <laughs> uh, when, when, yes, yeah, I told you when, when we met in person too. It was like, oh man, I got to flex next to that guy. <laughs> I just want to show you. You know, I'm still I'm about 210 pounds right now, 90 pounds heavier than when I became plant based 25 years ago, 
And whether it's my experiences or all those I've written about my books who can answer your question better, Dave, because they've been vegan more recently and they had, you know, direct comparisons to bodybuilding on an omnivorous diet and on a, on a plant-based diet. Um, I don't necessarily have those experiences, but what I do have is 25 years of going from runner to bodybuilder, runner to bodybuilder, and, some, and finding success all along the way through a great food, work ethic, you know, passion, desire, uh, hard work, and just determination to make a difference. So um, yeah. that's, my, that's my, my long story, but it has lots of layers to it. So I wanted to share that with you today. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Robert. And that's fantastic. And you, know, you really touched on what is actually a really important point and the whole thing, if a lot of people, if they choose to go vegan, they, it's like to think it'll solve everything, you know? So it, it's great that you had that year where you had no results because it wasn't just about you going vegan. Like that, a lot of people, for instance, will ditch vegan because, oh, it didn't do this, it didn't do that. Instead of seeing, right, there's a lot more to this. You know, there's like our mind, there's the right program, there's the right hydration, there's the right food, the right combinations of the food. Like there's a lot of unhealthy vegans. It's not just case you go vegan and you're super healthy, you're build a muscle, you're faster, you're everything. You know, there's a lot more to it. Food is quite complex. And obviously there's a mind-body nutrition connection as well. So it's a really important point you touched on. And it's an important part of your journey. You had that first year with minimal results and then made some changes and saw a bigger picture. And basically you've, you're that kind of roller coaster up and down of different experiences of very contrary types of training and results. You know, again, obviously the whole plant-based living helped with that. So that's fantastic. So thanks for sharing all that, Robert. I right, go on to you, Annie. So again, you know, that kind of pre-post vegan experience in terms of recovery and endurance. And one uh, thing I one thing I won't be doing is I won't be getting out my biceps. That's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mine's a little bit more interesting. I loved your story, Robert. Absolutely loved it. Um, and, and I thought it was really interesting. I think when it comes to training, there are so many things that we need to take into consideration training for anything is incredibly complex whether you are an endurance athlete whether you're a sprinter whether you're whether you're training you know to build muscle for strength for sheer size whatever it might be it's actually incredibly complex and sadly i think um i don't think a, an awful lot of people do take all of those uh, those things into consideration i certainly think that when um if you come across vegan um athletes they there is still this this conception and in some sense rightly so that there has to be more consideration um that we do have to make con more consideration with our diet because essentially people think we're taking something out we are not um but that's just that's just the the, the i think the previous mindset um so i generally tend to think that we we train a little bit smarter as vegans and because we just think that we have to be a little bit more fastidious with certain things. So we do get things right, you know, hydration, et cetera, is, is, is a lot better. Anyway, going to the point, there is a big difference with me and my, um, and my performance prior um, going vegan to now. Um, and that is, uh, we talked about this before, Dave, um, when you are training at such a level, you know, I was competing for England, running for Great Britain regularly. I, I competed right the way throughout the year, cross country in the winter. I did the indoor season in February. I was on the track, you know, sort of in the summer, running and racing all over the place. You are constantly stressing your immune system and your immune system is compromised when you are training at such a high level. And one of the biggest things that we have to uh, be incredibly mindful of when we are training and competing at such a level is trying to maintain balance. You're always teetering on that edge. You're pushing your body to such a level that it's almost that breaking point because that's what you've got to do to be able to train for those extra few seconds that you're trying to get, you know, whether it's on the track or, in the, or out in the country, whatever it might be. And you are always on the edge of injury. And the biggest thing for me during my running career was actually illness. I, my immune system seemed to be, I think when I look back now, pretty terrible. As I was due to peak, so we, I only planned to peak probably twice a year. Um, and anything else I achieved within that year was, was, a, was a bonus. Um, but you could almost guarantee that, depending on how well I, we'd timed it, I would get a cold either just before or, or 
at the time of whatever competition it was. And that's just because we've trained so, so, so hard um, that we, we gen our immune system, like I said, has been suppressed. Now, it was something that hugely affected me for years and years and years. And it was always incredibly, really debilitating colds. Now, this was just the most beautiful find of going vegan. Even though my career had ended, I still train ridiculously hard. I still train at a very, very, very high level. I'm still always pushing myself. Um, I'm definitely still on that cusp at times. But since going vegan, I, my immune system is just, is just I, it's unrecognizable to how it used to be. My, my colds, I very, very, very rarely get them. And, and I was probably four times a year, and I mean four times a year, and bad, heavy, heavy colds. And I just don't get them anymore. Um, I, and for me, for consistency and whatever it is that we're training for, like, like we've gone through all the different, different events, running, weightlifting, anything, your your progression whatever it is you achieve is all down to consistency there's no point in being able to train really 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 hard and high for a, a month and then your body breaks down and then you rebuild it again and then you go again it's about consistency being able to train at a high level and build gradually and being consistent with your training and undoubtedly injuries and illnesses affect that you take one of those away and that you've got a great, you know, your, your training immediately becomes a completely different thing. And that's the biggest thing for me is being, I don't suffer from, I know it sounds ridiculous, the common cold, it shouldn't sound a big deal, but when you are training, when you're competing, it's one of the biggest things to try and avoid. An illness for me, it just made me, it just changed me completely. And I became much, and with that becomes confidence, much more confidence in my body. I was, my body was almost working with me rather than against me. So when I was getting super fit, it was almost like my body would rebel. It's like, now we're working together. It's far, it's, everything's all good, you know? And, and it, we, it's just, it's a lovely equilibrium, I think. And I just generally feel a whole, whole, whole lot better. So without doubt, my, for me, my difference has been il, um, illness and lack of, Brilliant. And it's so important because, you know, we all know that when, when we have got ill as rare as it is, or to be able to compare back years ago when we got ill more frequently, from a training perspective, set you back so much. You know, even if it's something for a week, you've lost weeks and you're trying to build up then for another two weeks, get back to where you were. So in essence, like four weeks, it, could, it should have been one week. So it's a super important point. And who, who wants to feel bad at the end of the day? Who wants to feel ill? You know, it's not something we want. So when you make that less frequent by having, especially a whole food plant-based diet, it makes such a difference. And obviously the training, the carryover is massive. So that's great to hear. Why don't you, Nathan, again, pre and post, the difference in terms yeah, of training? Yeah, mine's a, bit, yeah, mine's a bit similar to Robert's really. I wasn't really doing much training before, before I turned vegan. I was you know, training a little bit in the gym. I didn't really know what I was doing. Very, very much the similar, similar story, really. And uh, I suppose, really, when it, when I first went vegan, it, there was a there was a noticeable difference in uh, recovery time, uh, which which everybody you know says now. It doesn't matter who you talk to, especially the people who have you know changed overnight and have trained you know trained hard and then and then gone you know gone vegan. They they all say that the the recovery time is so much quicker. So it just shows us our, our bodies are very efficient with what what we're putting in and, and utilizing everything really and uh, you know if you if you get the training right you get the food right and you get the you know the sleeping and the recovery side of it right so uh, you know you, you're always going to get great improvement so as soon as you knock down one of those you, you're really going to struggle so um there, there was a, there was a slight change definitely for me um but yeah it's not not quite so obvious as it would be for some other people um, other things as well, like, like Annie said as well, you know, you, um, it's consistency, isn't it? You know, you consistently eat the, the right sort of foods, train the right way, you know, sleep, you're, you're, you're going to be well away, really. Um, same as Robert said about, you know, once you realise you, you just increase those calories, you get, the, you get the right amount of protein and the carbs and the fats in your diet, and you train really hard and, and you know, you try and keep away from injuries, uh, 
you know, once you get those things right, you will, you will absolutely, you know, get better at whatever you want to achieve, whether, whether that is the, you know, getting bigger like me and Robert or, or getting, you know, a lot uh, fitter like Annie did with her training. So, uh, yeah, that's my, that's my side right there. Excellent, Nathan. And then from my side, like I touched on it a little bit earlier, um, like for me, like I played sports growing up, then I went into bodybuilding 25 years ago. It was an after a couple of years. Actually, I did body for life, actually, Robert. I, did a, I was champion in Ireland for that when I first started. <laughs> so these have a natural bodybuilding versus a lot of the, back then, especially, it was kind of a wild west. And that's what made me decide, look, there's just two two little rules in this game for me, and I was always going to stay natural. So I'm going to go into something that I have more control over. That's what made me go into endurance sports. So into like 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons, eventually onto triathlons and competing Olympic distance. And like I said earlier, the difference for me was even in that one training session, the difference in that kick I got, and that became more and more common. But my my performance kept getting better and better, and I was able to push harder and harder where I might need a day or two to recover after a hard session. Now I was able to go hard practically every day. And when I say every day, I mean five days, six days of the week. You always need at least one day rest, if not two, depending on the intensity of your overall training program. But I was able to go like full on every time and always full on with progress, not just training. And like in my Olympic distance times, I went from like at the start of one year, I think it was about 250 for Olympic distance to my best when then was 222. And that was like within one year like that's an incredible difference in that short space of time no matter what you're doing and i can 100 percent attribute it in a big big part to me being vegan at that time of course mindset's a big thing but i had a good strong mind years and years before that you know so that was a missing piece for me that was the thing that it was quite obvious that is what created that incredible increase in my finish time in just a year and it's continued no matter what you know people will always ask me whether it be clients or people i meet about you know, oh, can you rebuild muscle? Can you get faster? Can you do this? And I've always exper smir experimented on myself as a coach, like a guinea pig, whether it be building muscle, getting faster, you know, whatever it might be, leaner. And for everything, it's always faster. Of course, it's different for different people, but it's always faster, especially the cleaner and more whole food you're actually eating. So, yes, the difference for me in terms of performance recovery has been immense. Um, I just want to go into a question I was asked in the, one of the chat rooms earlier on. And um, it's more about mental fitness, okay? And mental fitness is something that is, needs to become more and more important, especially in this year and what we've all, you know, experienced and gone through. And something's important for everyone. And just in terms of like, tying in kind of mental fitness, motivation, brain function, like did anyone feel like a difference in how their brain function changed even in terms of focus, concentration, memory, or just in general, their overall mental fitness, what kind of strategies do you use? So we started again with Robert. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I think this is so important. And I love that Annie mentioned one of my favorite words in the entire world, not just vegan, but the word consistency. I've, I, I've said that that's maybe the most important word in the world because consistency is going to determine who you are. You are the sum of your actions. You are the sum of your thoughts. You are the sum of where you put your energy. We have 1,440 minutes every day to live our best lives and do the best we can to work towards our goals. So to start with, you gotta have something that you're working toward. You gotta have something that you care about, that you get, you don't have to, you don't have to jump out of bed excited every day to do it, but you've gotta have something to work toward. Otherwise, what's going to motivate you or inspire you to keep going and being consistent? You know, like I said, I had no business in bodybuilding, Dave. It was laughable. In fact, I used to get laughed at at the gym. I was some little tiny guy lifting weights. Uh, what, what are you doing? You know, stick to running. What, we have no business being here in the gym. Look at that guy. But I had a goal. I could picture five years ahead. I could picture 10 years ahead. I knew that what I do today is going to impact tomorrow. And it's going to impact a week from now and a month from now and a year from now. And I always had to think in the, in the present, like not, I mean, I had to plan for the future, but think in the present, like I am already a champion. I am already successful. I am making progress. I had to think about that every day. Uh, you talked about the mental strength. Um, Annie talked about sometimes, you know, not feeling all that great, right? Uh, there were times when I was stressed or when I was sick or feeling ill. And every single day I said, I feel great. Even if I didn't, I said, I feel great. I always kept that positive frame of mind. And Dave, something I used to do when I was a young vegan athlete, every single day, I used to write in a, in a, in a journal something that I was proud of that day. Just, you know, some 
I, I ran, you know, 15 miles today. I rode a bike 33 miles today. I ran 39 miles in two days, a marathon and a half marathon the next day. Something I didn't know I was capable of doing. But look, I, I did it. I, I showed myself, I, I proved to myself I could do it. Uh, I am proud of this. Uh, I, I, I played, you know, American football where before I wouldn't have had a chance. I was too small. But now as I was lifting weights, I was a vegan bodybuilder. I could tackle anybody, you know, I could take anybody down. And I wasn't scared and I was the best player or whatever. Something I was proud of every day. And I also wanted to touch on, it's not just the mental strength of, I'm gonna work out today. I'm gonna to make it a priority. I'm going to uh, work hard. Like I'm gonna be the hardest working in the gym. You know, I'm gonna grit my teeth and grunt and I'm gonna be the hardest working person in here. But it's also the mental strength to understand that we need to diversify our food sometimes and realize that plants have 64 times more antioxidants than animal-based foods. That most people, at least in America, 97% of Americans don't consume enough fiber. Fiber is only found in plants. Uh, the Achilles heel for American health and probably in the UK and other areas as well is, is high cholesterol. And dietary cholesterol is only found in animal foods. Uh, Nathan mentioned earlier about recovery and energy that almost every plant-based athlete you talk to, Nathan said that, you can ask anybody, they see a difference in recovery and, and with their energy. And why is that? Well, because we're eating anti-inflammatory foods rather than pro-inflammatory foods. We're focusing on the most nutrient-dense, vitamin, mineral-rich foods possible. This has to be part of the mental approach too, because we can say, you know what, I'm just gonna eat you know, these vegan foods, and even if they have no net impact on my athletic performance, I like the way they taste, I like these treats, I like all these sweets, I like all these thousands of calories, and wonder why I can't shed fat, why I can't get lean, why I can't you know, look like these people I see on Instagram. Uh, that affects our mental approach as well. So then we say, why bother? You know, why, why should I even try to be an athlete if uh, I'm not making progress? Well, sometimes we're not making progress because we're not putting ourselves in a position to succeed in the first place. So I would say it starts with checking right here. You know, really, what do you want to do? Ask yourself, what brings joy? What form of exercise brings joy to my life? It's not just running and lifting weights. You know, dance is exercise. Tennis is exercise. Mountaineering, mountain climbing, hiking is exercise. Skiing and snowboarding and uh, playing, playing soccer or football with friends, that's exercise. Find what speaks to you. And, you. and you know what? You're more likely to do it. If you find something you love, you're more likely to do it. And guess what? When you're more likely to do it, you naturally get better at it. I've said it too many times already, Dave. I had no business in the sport of bodybuilding. I shouldn't have been there. No business succeeding or finding any success whatsoever. But I showed up. I showed up day after day after day. I showed up. And I worked hard, like Nathan said, and I got bigger and I got stronger. And all of a sudden I found myself even at the 2006 Natural Bodybuilding World Championships. How did I get here? How did I get here? Because I visualized it, you know, 10 years earlier, right? I, I connected the dots ahead of time. I said, you know, someday I will get bigger. Someday I will get stronger. And someday it's going to lead to some opportunity. And maybe I will be able to write a book about it, maybe make a movie about it, inspire one person or thousands of people. And that's where I think it starts, Dave. The, the mental toughness starts from what do you want to do and how can you apply yourself in meaningful ways that will change the world for you and for others. And that still drives me to this day. And so I, I, I'm grateful. I'm just grateful I was able to discover that, that if I could apply myself in something I was deeply passionate about, even if I wasn't good at it, I could eventually get better. And as I got better, I would enjoy it more. And as I enjoyed it more, I would improve and then I was able to find success. So that's where it starts with me. And for anyone listening, you know, if you're struggling, how do you, how do you find your passion? Um, consider what, what do you do when you have free time, when weekends come around or when you're not working or when you're doing something that's just purely for joy? What is that? And, and hone in on that and, and practice your craft and get better at it and, and, and see where it takes you and see what kind of doors open up. Excellent stuff. And it's like I say to people, like be persistently consistent. Like consistency will <laughs> be persistently consistent. Let nothing stop you. Uh, any anything to add to that? Again, any like that, the minds, mental health, mindset, motivation, the, you know, any improvements brain function wise, anything like that? Massively, actually. Um, as an athlete, 
um, when I was competing, I would say that um, mentally that was my weakness. I had the most incredible work ethic you could ever imagine. I was, you know, track session started seven. I, that was it. I was there warmed up, ready. We started at seven. You know, I was absolutely, I, I was so driven, so motivated with what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve that almost at that point, nothing would stop me at all. Um, and I was, I was absolutely, you know, determined and, you know, like I said, on it um, with, 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 with my training, everything I was doing. When that um, ended, you still have that same kind of, I still, I'm still that person. I'm still that incredibly driven, that incredibly passionate um, individual. It doesn't go, it's just, where do I put this? What do I do with all this? You know, I, I have this incredible amount of energy, passion, drive it has to go somewhere um and but going back to my my mental the mental side of it being a bit weaker for me is i definitely had a little bit of self-doubt on race day the only thing that would get me through was the fact i knew i'd put in the work maybe my self-belief wasn't so great but i knew i'd done the work i'd banked the sessions and that's what got me through take those races away what do I do with that now? How do I still train? How do I still contain this, this way of thinking? How do I contain all of this that's in me? Where do I put it? What do I do with it? And this is, this is the veganism and animals and my absolute passion for animals and animal rights and that what we do with the animals and the way we treat them is so wrong. Um, my motivation for training now, believe it or not, comes from that. So I am an absolute free spirit. I believe we can do and be, see, do anything and everything we do in life matters. Um, and absolutely every choice, every decision we make makes a difference, makes an impact somewhere. And, and I absolutely exercise my freedoms. I love being free. And for me, fitness gives me my freedom. And where this comes from, to the animals is we've taken away those animals freedoms we cage them we take away every single natural desire that they may have whatever that may be that the way that they are naturally driven to live their life we've taken that we've taken that away from them they're not free in any way shape or form if anybody was to take that away from me i i i, I couldn't imagine that so with that being so deep rooted for me weirdly that's my motivation with with training i'm making that decision because i can i am in complete control of my life i am exercising the freedoms that i have got i want to be fit i want to be able to go somebody says come on tomorrow we're going to go climb a mountain somewhere guess what i want to go and i'll go exercising my freedoms i'm fit enough i'm capable and able to do that and it gives by being as fit as you possibly can be opens up so many other avenues to life and it gives you that confidence and belief that you can and be and do anything and we are in complete control of that and some days when i'm not quite feeling it and i know some people who potentially be watching this will almost roll their eyes i do think of the animals if there's if there's a day when i really don't want to do something or if it's really hot like we've had a really beautiful week this week but it's been incredibly hot not that you know Robert you're not you're so far away but we've had a bit of a heat wave this week it's been quite unbelievable and it makes training a lot more difficult and undoubtedly when I'm thinking and I'm finding that quite hard my mind immediately goes to the, the to the livestock trucks I think oh my god they've been they've been de dehydrated 24 hours prior to slaughter however many bodies have all been shoved into the into the livestock trucks and that they're having they have no choice they have um, they have no choice no rights no nothing they're living breathing sentient beings that are going through pure hell and i'm just moaning i don't want to go on a bike or i don't want to go out training that and i know it sounds a bit of a strange connection but that is what is there in the forefront of my mind and i'm so aware of that and it's just a very strange way of me i am in control of what i'm doing i am making this choice because i have a choice and this is what I want to do. And there are so many other, 
you know, not just animals, but people as well that don't have, who don't have that ability to be able to make that decision, make that choice. I do, and I'm not going to waste it. Excellent, Danny. And again, your passion for us obviously shines through. And, <laughs> and like the, the, bottom, the bottom line is like your mind is the control tower. It's like you mentioned about control as well, like two points from what you said. Now, one, your mind is the control tower. So we are in control of what we do. So people, need, you know, they make excuses, but they need, need to own the fact that they are making excuses, you know? So, and you have to have a why, you know, it's like Robert and yourself have shared again, but like a why. You, know, you have to have a why because something has to drive you on when you really don't feel like it. Because the reality is, we're all human, we're all emotional beings. There's going to be loads of times we don't want to train, don't want to eat well, don't want to do the things we know we should, but we need to have something to latch on to go, well, that's why I'm going to do it. And that drives us on. Um, Nathan, anything you want to add? Again, mental fitness, brain function, motivation, all that sort of things. Yeah, there's a couple of things there. So, yeah, completely, completely with uh, Robert's um, um, conversation about it and Dan is as well. It's a, it's a huge thing to have... Um, animals there in the back of your mind to keep you keep you motivated that is a, you know it's a fantastic way um, because i do uh, quite a lot of street activism as well um, um, um i like to look the part as well because then when people say oh yeah but what about you know i do training and stuff like this and how am i going to get you know how am i going to get my nutrients and stuff and then very often people will send them over to me to say yeah here you go look this is, you know, this guy's been vegan 14, 15 years and he's, he's not had an issue. So that's another motivation for me to, you know, to really keep keep my mind set on, you know, on, on what I should be doing. And, uh, yeah, that keeps you training. That, that keeps you doing it, you know, day in, day out, really. Um, other things as well, uh, my children definitely are, are something that really keeps me, keeps me going. I want them to be healthy. I want them to see that, you know, I'm thriving as well, and you know when they've obviously gone through their school, their school years, and getting, you know, a lot of kids obviously know that they're vegan, and you know that gives them a bit of a um, a tough time, I suppose, in, in you know in some cases, and and I want them to think, well, yeah, you know, my dad's really fit and healthy, and you know and that gives them a good reason to you know counteract some of the you know the, the arguments, questions that they get as well. So that's that's another side of it. Um, and then the other thing as well is um, a lot more research is coming out about the, the microbiome and how that affects our uh, mental health as well. So obviously where we're putting a lot more, you know, good nutrients in, we're, we're, we're making those, uh, those bacteria in the microbiome thrive. Um, that's going to boost, you know, your serotonin levels and all these other things that they're finding out now. So that is another huge benefit for, you know, for choosing the plant-based options definitely so a few a few extra things there as well excellent stuff nathan and like that it's like the kids like for me my son is always my boy you know whenever i don't feel like doing something my son is my boy because i need to be a good role model for him so i need again like any parent it's like leading the way they will follow what you do whether that be good or bad or whatever it may be that's a huge why for me as well as even just people who follow me online and stuff you know i need to be a good example because if i am a good example then more people are going to follow that type of example. And because I'm leading a life I feel is good for my own health, for animals and the planet, more and more people then hopefully will follow that lifestyle. And that's my little bit that I can do, my tiny bit of influence I can have to make the world a better place and better for all of us at the end of the day. Um, quick one there, anyone who's watching, if you have any specific questions for us as a group or anyone specific, pop, pop into the Q&A. I do have quite a few questions to go through that I've been asked in the, light, in the chat uh, room functions as well as across social media the last couple of days but I'll get through as many as I can and we can do some answers in the actual chat rooms afterwards if we run out of time but put them into the Q&A you see it at the bottom tab Q&A tab okay um, a few people have asked you know what what currently you're working on what kind of target are you working on I'll start with myself like I set a target um, last year I want to qualify for the World Ironman Championships 2021 in Kona Hawaii um, it's a huge belief for me in terms of I've been doing Olympic distance triathlon for many years, but now this is Ironman. So it's like going from a 1.5 kilometer swim to a 3.8 kilometer swim, a 42 kilometer cycle to a 180 kilometer cycle, and a 10K run to a 42K run. That's all back to back, by the way, if you don't know what triathlon is. You know, there's no rest. But again, it's a huge challenge, but this is where the mind comes in, like we've all touched on. I 100% believe that I will do it. I know physically I can get to that point. 
I know mentally I have it, but also again, the why. I have my why, which again, be a good example and show setting goals and what can be achieved to my son as well as followers. And also again, it's another, again, vegan athlete who's just like a normal person. I'm not a pro athlete, but a normal person competing with the pros at a world championship event. So, so that's my goal. All going well, it'll be going ahead next year. You know, at the moment, obviously there's lots of uncertainty, but I'm training for it anyway. So Robert, eight in particular, you're training for right now. Any particular goal you have, or are you just kind of generally training? Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, you know, right now, really, to be honest, you know, I retired from competitive bodybuilding 10 years ago, and I've been training just for the fun of it uh, for the last 10 years. And, and really, my priority has been writing my latest book. You know, I have a new book called The Plant-Based Athlete coming out next year. And that's like where my energy went. In fact, I even took a few months off. I'll just be honest, Dave. I took a few months off from training because I wanted to give everything that I had 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day to writing the best book possible. So I put my energy there and I submitted that book July 1st. So it's been a little while now, got some revisions to do, but I got back in the, you know, got back in the gym, got back to training. Uh, I don't know, five, six weeks ago, whatever it's been now. And, you know, I, I'm age 40 now. So what I'm, I'm really, I guess I'm, it's kind of cliche, but I'm using that milestone as something to motivate me, I guess. You know, some people think, oh, by the time you're at age 40 or age 50 or whatever at age, you know, you, you can't train or can't, you know, achieve anymore. And so I'm 40 years old now. I've been doing this for a long time. And like I said earlier, you know, maybe just 30 minutes ago, I think maybe the best is yet to come. So I'm training for the fun of it right now, but I'm being consistent, like Annie said. I'm working hard, like Nathan said. You know, I, I found my why, like you said, and that why is just to, uh, to do something that I've enjoyed for most of my life. Like most of my life, I've enjoyed exercise since I was just a little kid. And I've been vegan most of my life. And there's no reason to stop now uh, doing the things that I've enjoyed and, and have shaped my identity and, uh, and how I view the world. And so, uh, to be honest, Dave, I'm just, I'm training for the fun of it right now, but I'm also trying to be my biggest and my best in my 40s. So we'll see what happens. Excellent, excellent. The 40s club isn't that bad. I'm in there too. <laughs> Aren't you, Annie? So what are you particularly- I, I don't have to say what club I'm in, do I? <laughs> um, I have a couple of motivations, um, for sure. Um, number one, I think that, you know, I, as you know, and probably from speaking today, you know, undoubtedly my biggest motivator is, is the animals and to try and spread the vegan message as much as possible. And that, um, so that, you know, we dispel that misconception that you either have to look a certain way, you know, that, that you do look a certain way if you, if you're vegan and that, you know, you can't, how, how can you do certain things? My motivator is to look as fit as possible, physically as fit and healthy as possible, so that you're a living, breathing, um, you know, advocate for something that you believe so, so passionately in, you know, and that, that for me is, is, is so, so powerful and so important. I obviously, I do actually have a bit of a goal, um, you know, but that's sort of, for me, that's, I think when my career ended, it wasn't, it ended prematurely and I had a lot of um, probably negative feelings and emotions, I think, towards it because I didn't, you know, I, I ended it, I, my career ended very abruptly and under not great circumstances. So for me to go back and compete and to be competing again has never been anything that's been of interest to me. Um, it's always been very, um, very, very um, internal. Um, I want to be the best I can be. And, and, but I have set myself a challenge. I would, even with my aging legs, I would like to do um, a triathlon next year. Now, I am fit enough. I will get round, but it's typical of, of anybody, I think, that's like us, really you don't just want to get round. Um, you know, it's, I, I want to get round and I, I will want to do quite well. Um, and, and I will be wholly disappointed if I didn't. So if I don't get to a certain level with my fitness where I don't think I can actually compete, because I'd like to actually race, I'd like to actually compete um, in, in the triathlon only once probably. Um, 
then you know yeah that that's what i'd like to do but definitely without a doubt my other motivator is looking strong looking healthy looking fit so that people are a little bit surprised when when you say that you're vegan um, because it's a very important message for me for sure fantastic so being a role model especially and a triathlon absolutely <laughs> a, tri a triathlete role model Woo -hoo! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Are you trained for some specific at the moment? Any specific goals that you're aiming to nail? Um, so I'm not quite in the 40s club yet. I'm 38, uh, soon to be 39. So uh, when you're a baby, I'm not quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so very similar to Robert. Actually, I want to I want to just prove that even even when you're getting older, you, it's still very possible to you know to increase your size, strength, and and, and your fitness as well. So uh, that that's definitely a, a big motivation to me um, uh, also I'd like to I've, I've sort of been on and off with trying to sort of start a YouTube type of career and, and, and push that so I think I really need to crack on with that now I've been uh, been a bit lapsed with that so I'd like to put out some content I'm really trying to motivate people into you know changing their, their diet and lifestyles to and to our to our side of it, so um, I should really should really push on with that. So I think that's going to be the the next challenge for me is to really um, push the whole um, social media, um, you know, YouTube stuff. Yeah. Good stuff, Nick. Make a bigger influence, make a bigger impact. You know, so a great reason. Um, before actually, we've about 10 minutes left. I'm hoping to fit in about four more questions if I can. As I say, keep them coming. The next question I'm going to get Robert and Nathan's answer and the one after myself and Annie. So I'm going to read it out here because it was sent in earlier. So for Robert and Nathan and whoever wants to start first, how do we encourage friends and family who are not vegan to adopt more of a plant-based diet to improve their training, their health and their fitness, even when you're outperforming them and that's still not stimulating them to make that decision. So whichever first. You want, you want, are you, I've been going first the whole time. Feel free to, <laughs> if you want to go, I'll go ahead. Yeah. I've always been last, so I'll, I'll swap around. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a challenging one really. Normally when somebody sees you, you know, getting better at something, that's a, that's a good reason for them to, you know, to want to try different things. And um, yeah, it's a tough one really. I think with, with everybody, there's normally one, there's normally one thing that sort of gets them, you know, quite interested in it. So it's either they'll, you know, the health reasons or, you know, if they, if they find out about the animals or, or then if they're not really so much um, swayed by the fitness side, then it may well be, you know, they may have to try and um, try and convince them another way, really. It's a, it's a challenging one. I'm not quite sure exactly what any ideas, Robert. Yeah, you know, it is a challenging question. And, and really, the hardest people to influence are often the people closest to us, our family and friends. We can spend our whole lives dedicated so much energy to try to change them. But you really can't change anybody. You know, we can only change ourselves. We can lead by example. We can show resources and references and things like the game changers and books and documentaries and all of that. And sometimes that, that works, but influencing or changing people closest to us is incredibly difficult. So what I would say is, uh, even if you're already outperforming someone, uh, you know, and they're still unwilling to change their diet or lifestyle, or even not really open to it, maybe you can find a role model they look up to in, in professional sports or Olympic quality sports. I mean, there's so many now, plant-based athletes, including in the UK and around the world. I mean, so many great boxers and power lifters and Olympic lifters and bodybuilders and uh, endurance athletes, race car drivers, um, basketball players, footballers, you mean rugby players, you name it, uh, cricket players. There's plant-based athletes at the top of all of those levels. Tennis, of course, you know, we didn't mention men's and women's tennis, the, some of the best in the world are fully plant-based. And so sometimes it's, it's showing other examples besides just ourselves, or, you know, it, it's it introducing uh, them to specific foods, like, you know, in a non-confrontational way, a very warm and welcoming way, like share some food, like here, this is my pre-workout, this is my post-workout, you know, try some of this today and let's, and let's see how our workouts go. So I think always, um, you know, leading by example and some sort of uh, friendly approach, warm approach is always going to be best, but it's, it's a challenge, uh, no question about it. And uh, you just got to try different things and, and hopefully something sticks. 
Excellent. Good stuff. Yeah, again, like being a role model is the biggest thing. And I think like what Robert said, sometimes people just will not react to you, especially if they're close to you. Like the clo you could be the most renowned person in the world in anything. People close to you typically will not listen to you, as baffling and illogical as it is. That's just kind of how it is. Um, but yeah, I think like that, keep being a role model and keep sharing information. And like what Robert said there, share, if they're into, for instance, football, like soccer, send them to soccer players. Like even in the premiership in England now, there's a few premiership footballers coming up saying that they're vegan. And they've been for a few years when they probably haven't because they were afraid of the kind of maybe backlash they'd get, or even maybe the clubs didn't want them to or something. There's like a fully vegan uh, football club, Forest Green. I think they're about division one or something now. You know, there's uh, what's his name Chris Smalling playing for Roma in Italy so there's more and more footballers which obviously in this side of the world is massive obviously in the US soccer is a, a big sport there now but not compared to NBA and basketball and so on but more and more athletes so UFC even <laughs> UFC suppose you want mach macho men alpha males and how many of them are plant-based vegan now you know and being open about it so you know it's 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 using these resources for the people who won't listen to you Give them, give them what they need. If they're into a particular sport, give them athletes in that sport, and typically that will do it. It might be a bit frustrating going, what the hell, I said exactly what they said, but it doesn't matter. Whatever gets them kind of over the line. Uh, next question, so myself and Annie. So Annie, you'd go first on it. Um, it's, it's a guy who contacted me. He's, he's a cyclist, decent enough cyclist, but he started to feel he's leveling off a lot recently, reached a plateau. He follows a whole food plant-based diet, and he just can't really understand why he might be plateauing. So any advice you'd give him on how to break it? I would imagine, sorry to be a little bit boring on this, that it probably is down to what he's doing in training rather than his diet. Um, plateau for me certainly would indicate that maybe he's just stayed at some, something somewhere needs mixing up. Um, now, if he's struggling with recovery, then then he does need to look at probably calorie intake and also the amount of protein he is taking in because obviously that is what's going to help and aid him aid his recovery. So there's three things I would probably suggest that he looks at. Number one is hydration levels, making sure that is is hydrated all of the time, not just during his his rides, um, but he's permanently permanently hydrated um, because obviously we know the effects of recovery upon that. Um, then the sec because I also would imagine that recovery maybe a slow recovery between sessions is what's also um, being a problem for the next training session as well and when you're training at really high levels your recovery is just as important as the actual content of the training that you're doing so we're, we're talking here about things to aid his recovery so hydration make sure that he's not on a negative calorie intake so to make sure that he's at least bringing in what he's expelling if he's not then he, he doesn't need to change what he's eating. He simply needs to just eat more of it. It's quite difficult, really, to sort of think what that could be with such limited information. But that would be one thing I would look at. Um, and obviously, potentially what he's eating, just making sure that he is, you know, I know that, you know, um, it's quite a big area, quite controversial, talking about, you know, the essential and, not, and the non-essential pro, uh, proteins and things. So making sure that he is that his diet's as varied as possible. But first and foremost, I would actually look at his training, make sure it's documented, is depending on what it is he's training for, um, make sure that he, he documents it for a good couple of weeks, has a look, and maybe he might be duplicating too many certain types of training sessions. And I would imagine that he'd probably just need to up something somewhere. And then he'll, he might have a couple of difficult weeks because he's increased the tempo. But then I think he'll find that he would then It'll, it'll push on from there, I, I would imagine. So those are the three things I would address if yeah, I were him. Danny. Yeah, like I think the training has to be a bigger issue with it. And you know, yeah. being, with a lot of endurance athletes, there's too much focus on volume when you have to focus as much as on intensity and quality is the volume. A lot of people are happy, I did 500 miles cycling this week. Well, what kind of 500 miles? Is it quality or quantity? Because if you're focusing on quantity, then you're not getting any progressions. When the thing should be each time or at least a few times a week, whatever training you're doing, you're doing something that's going to progress and to get you further. And if you do the same thing all the time, how can you expect to get better? So changing up your program, you know, stimulate, putting in something completely different. Are you doing weight training? You know, there's, there's so many different ways of doing it, but the shock factor is what you probably need more than anything. And it's like Andy said, even something as simple as water, like how hydrated are you? 
because if you're not too hydrated, you know, you're 80, 75% of your body is water, 83% is, is in your brain, and your brain doesn't retain water, so it's going to have a huge impact on your performance. So, you know, how hydrated are you? That's a massive one. So definitely Can I just add something as well? Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Just add something as well. As endurance athletes, something that I've definitely found um, with, with, with the majority of endurance athletes is that they do, um, they really do uh, lack strength training. So you will find that they're quite happy to pound the streets. They're quite happy to get the miles and on the bike, but they don't really realize the importance of, of strength training. Even if that, even if they're, they don't have access to a gym body weight, working with your own body weight. Um, it's absolutely vital for any type of training. And like, and like we said, if, he's, if it's because he's feeling that his legs are going and his, his, that's why he's reaching a plateau and he can't quite push on to the next level, he needs to, he needs to get on. Um, it needs to get a little bit stronger. So get out those squats, those lunges, you know, um, weighted step ups, anything like that. Get the glutes and the quads working and work, work with some kind of resistance. And I would imagine he'll find quite a big difference if, if he did that. Sorry, I didn't mean to put in. But that was no, 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 cool. A lot of important points, you know, and I think, yeah, still in, in endurance sports, it's like still a bit taboo about it, you know, in terms of doing weight training. But it's coming more and more, but it needs to come in much faster. Uh, yeah. We're, we have a couple of minutes left. Do we, do we, yeah, a couple of minutes. So we just want to quickly go game changers. Someone asked her about game changers. What kind of impact do you think it has made or will make? Robert. Yeah, I think it's going to have a tremendous impact. Uh, it's, it's having a huge impact here over in the U.S. I was actually at the Game Changers premiere in Hollywood. I got to meet all kinds of great people and see some old friends as well. And what I've seen online and what I've seen just talking to people. You know, I, I, I tour around the country and, and sometimes around the world uh, all year long until, of course, COVID-19. And I, I would hear about the game changers everywhere, including at mainstream fitness events that are not vegan at all. Just the mainstream fitness community is talking about it. So I think it's, it will have a tremendous impact. I think it is having a tremendous impact and uh, perhaps a very long lasting impact, much like Forks Over Knives has and What the Health and a few other projects. So uh, I'm excited about it. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a supporter. It's great to see uh, so many wonderful athletes in that film. And so uh, I, I think it's going to continue to inspire people to keep animals off their plate, put plants on their plate, and discover the best version of themselves as plant-based athletes. Yeah, I think it's been amazing. It's, going, it's had a big effect and it's going to have an even bigger effect. And again, what's important, which we touched on a little while ago, the fact there's such a wide ranging types of athletes, no matter what type of sports or disciplines, it's very wide ranging. And, you know, we, like it, the science is in it, the proof is in it, the specimens are in it, male, female, every kind of race, everything, like everything is included. It shows from every kind of angle. And I, I thought it was a fantastic movie. And even like the... I can't remember the guy who was on Joe Rogan and uh, he was really trying to hammer it. And then who was the producer, Robert, again? What was his name, the producer? He's uh, James a, Wilkes. Yeah, he went on and I thought his responses was absolutely amazing. It's about a three-hour reply with Joe Rogan. Everyone should watch it. It really clarifies. Oh, was it on YouTube? It yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah, Game Changers is. is like, it's, it's always starting now and the impact it's had is going to have an even bigger one. Um, we're going to have one more question. Then we're going to have to wrap it up, sadly. Uh, just the one that, again, I got asked a lot during the week. got asked again in the chat room today. It's always bloody asked, but protein. How the hell can vegans get enough protein? Nathan. <laughs> well, it's, a, yeah, it's certainly not an issue. It's, a, it's obviously over. Um, people think about it way too much. Obviously, we do need to get enough protein. And, you know, as Annie said there with this other guy, that if, if, you're, not, if you're not getting enough, you're not going to be recovering enough. So... Uh, so it's definitely something you need to look at, but but generally, you know, if you're having plenty of you know beans, lentils, nuts and seeds, um, you know, adding adding a protein shake if you need to. I, I always recommend that you need to be you know, at least at least log what you're having for a couple of days into something like chronometer and just get get an idea of what you are having. You know, work out what you what you need and then you know adjust it to suit. But um, generally, it's it's not a huge issue to get the to get the amount of protein, not, not that I've found anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's an easy one really. And at the end of the day, it's like even the green leafy stuff with chlorophyll, that's even more important for recovery, whether it's building muscle or endurance anyway. Um, guys, you've been absolutely amazing. You shared so much great stories from your own life. I'm sure you've inspired many people. People have put into the chat box, the Q and A box, 
about you know thanks so much for the talk if you can get on the live chat and that we have the fitness chat room after it'd be great if anyone's any questions i just want to bring back veg fest founder tim guys thanks i've been listening away lurking there it's really interesting uh, it's really informative really inspiring and really hit the spot i think it's a lot of people who are uh, needing some good focus to keep the fitness and possibly that initial lockdown fitness drive might have worn off now. <laughs> the pubs have reopened and temptations are opened up again. So, um, but it's been absolutely fantastic and thank you for joining us. And it's one of the advents that's really positive uh, things is that of course you can join us from all over the world and people can access the information for free and people who have been excluded from the live events for various reasons perhaps for reasons of disability or or mobility issues or you know childcare dependency or looking after animals or such like logistics budgets transport um dislike of crowds dislike of london and big spaces and travel generally and you know there's all sorts of reasons why people have not actually been able to join these fantastic VegFest fitness panels um, that we've been doing. So this is a real big benefit of it. And, and I really do appreciate the enthusiasm that you've all shown for this and continue to do so. Um, but especially you, Dave, it really is a breath fresh air. You really do live up to your name, and Mr. Motivator. You've been <laughs> especially uh, staunch during this process, uh, I have to say, and it's not been easy. It's, it's not an easy process and it's not going to get any easier for a bit either. I think we know that. So it's up to us all to keep inspiring the, you know, especially the vegan fitness area. We've seen a few high profile dropouts. It's really good to see a lot of high profile people sticking with it too. And of course, as we know, the benefits we all get from the plant based diet, especially the recovery, you know, the, 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 the mental health aspects I've found particularly are just really important in this combination, good sleep, good food, good exercise. And, and I'm now at an age actually where I'm doing quite a lot of soft exercises, you know, Chinese Qigong sets and yoga sets and dancing. So I've got my biggest muscles right now, my calf muscles, because yeah. in lockdown I've been dancing pretty but much. It's fast them. Yeah. So my, my, my calf muscles have really put on some shape, I can, I can assure you. Um, but look, again, thanks very much. Thanks for listening, your participants. Um, the chat rooms are open. You can come and join and you can access this information for another 30 days afterwards. It is recorded. It will be available as from tomorrow. Um, and please do remember to pay a little trip to our exhibitors. Do go drop by our exhibitors, say hello, drop by, do a bit of browsing, perhaps do a bit of shopping too. Um, you know, they are the people who are also really helping pay for this platform. So it's important that our exhibitors um, get looked after and acknowledged and respected. And a thanks too for our sponsors, Butte Island Foods and Yaya Head Products. On that note, the comedy is starting in <laughs> less than two minutes and I've got to introduce them. So I should lift you all to it. And thank you very much again, Robert, Annie, Nathan and of course Dave and thank you for our VFES team for hosting <laughs> our VFES team for the hosting. and we will see you again and thank you very much once more. Bye. <laughs>